Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Design Recharge. I think this is episode 197 or 196. I'm really terrible with figuring that out. But episode 200 is coming. <laughs> anyway, but this is the last one for the year of 2016. And so I normally don't do any in December. I've been really bad. I've always done one. Um, but I get really kind of stressed. I don't know if you're like this, too, Ben, but at the end of the semester, it's like, oh my gosh, it's barely what I can do to get out of bed and take a shower. <laughs> you know, yep, there's totally. just so much on, on us. And so I have tried not to, but I, um, hadn't gotten to see Ben and I, in like a few years and I got to see him at this conference, um, in October and he is like a brother to me and he is working on his second book. This is book number one. So Kent, you should get your kids to get this. Actually, I think this is really a good book for anybody. It does kind of food, food and focus. That's what I was about to say. <laughs> food and focus. But it actually has stuff in there that anybody could really use, like contracts and simple things that people could go for. So it is a graphic design student's guide to freelance. And it actually takes them through a freelance process from freshman year, sophomore year, junior year, senior year, and then as they're done. So he's also, he's doing a new book and I'm super excited about the new book too. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today, but anyway, this is my good friend and brother from another mother, Ben Hanna. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Yeah. I was telling you earlier about how it's been fun to watch design recharge grow and you know, 200 is a big deal. So congratulations. Yeah. Uh, be sure and tune in for that 200th episode for sure to see you like have your your celebration there yeah i'll have some balloons maybe or or i'll have my big owl there you and go my little owl i'm not like an owl person but i just think these things are so cute <laughs> anyway this is how i focus just so you guys know this is what i do <laughs> So, all right, so we're getting back. See, I need to just, this is why I don't do uh, episodes in December because I'm just squirrely, I guess, all right, always. <laughs> so, Ben, give us a little bit of your background about design. Um, I know it, but tell everybody else what, what kind of your pathway was. Well, I, like you said, I went to grad school with you at VCU, and then I worked at VCU in Qatar for a little bit, and then came back and worked at Virginia Tech, and now I'm down at Elon in Elon, North Carolina. And um, so right around this time, I mean, I, I absolutely love teaching and I absolutely love design. Like the those two things, like being a designer and a design educator, are like the best. Like working with students is the best part of my job for sure, hands down. Um, it's always right around this time though that I see my students stressing out and particularly the seniors, right? right? And they're starting, like stuff's about to get real. You know, they've got one semester left and in May, that's it. They are um, going out into the work world, making that transition from an academic environment to a professional environment and they don't know what's coming and a lot of times I see them feeling anxious. I was walking through the hall at Elon the other day and two of my students were hanging out and they saw me and they were like, Oh my God, Oh my God, Oh my God. Oh my God. You know, like it's like, you know, starting to hit them. And, uh, you know, being a designer, I think that you develop a kind of this, um, sensitivity, you're this empathetic touch, you know, and, and in being a teacher, you know, those are your, your peeps. Those are your students. You know, those are the, people who a lot of your content is geared for. And so it made a lot of sense to try to like um, put together a resource to help alleviate some student fears, right? But I actually think this is not just a student fear. I actually think this is, and I've, I've told Robin Land of this uh, with other books that she's done. This is actually content that I actually feel it. people who are out there who are one, um, trying to change jobs or maybe trying to go from one part of our industry to another. Maybe they've been doing print and now they want to do UX UI or vice versa. I think this is a book that they would be able, because actually you, you just need to stay up on these things. And that's one of the big problems in school is that they're, they're too busy. Same way within the real world too. Yeah, absolutely. So um, you know, like you were saying, there's lots of books on portfolios out there. And when I was teaching a senior capstone class uh, last year, about, you know, last spring, 
um, I was looking at resources and I felt like the books came in two flavors. They were like this design portfolio showcase or this really like, you know, a portfolio is kind of definitions of portfolios and like, and so what I wanted to do is kind of like close that gap and I wanted to develop a book that's has a lot to do with the strategy behind your portfolio and making sure that your strategy is on point. So if it's okay with you, I'll switch over to like a screen share yeah. and then get going that way too and talk a little bit about some slides that I put together here. All right, go ahead. So this is the name of the book. If my editor lets me uh, keep it, um, you can insert any basically four letter word there. Uh, oh crap, I'm graduating. Student's Guide to Creating a Portfolio. Um, I believe that fear is like the biggest enemy of creativity. And so when I see my students like freaking out, I know that they're not going to be their best creative this creative self. Right. And so one of the things that I think is really helpful is to kind of allay those fears so that um, they can work more efficiently, you know, so that there's not this panicky, like I got to do something. I, I just want to, you know what I mean? But they're working efficiently. They know what they have to do and they're, there's, they're putting a plan in place. Um, so starting right out of the gate, the whole reason I put this together is because I saw my students panicking. Okay. Kind of a hard transition here, but do you guys remember like the new star Wars is getting ready to come out? What is it on Thursday? Is that right? I can't remember. Uh, yeah. It's, it's right around the corner, but do you remember a year ago when you, or maybe a little over a year when you first saw this trailer for star wars right and we didn't know who this character was um so jj abrams was describing this evil villain that's going to take darth vader's place sorry spoiler alert i should have announced that before but um as this kind of dark knight right and we saw in this trailer this lightsaber with this like cross guard on it and it was totally new design and everybody was freaking out like they were like oh my gosh i you know dying to see that new Star Wars and to see what happens. Well, Doug Chang said that I love it when design does that. It informs who the character is, right? And so he was the person in charge of creating that lightsaber. And what he did is he created something that really set the tone for the Star Wars episodes, like the future ones that are coming, the ones where J.J. Abrams took over and he's directing it, right? So, you know, starting with this as a point of departure, and start beginning to talk about portfolios, like your portfolio is a prop that you use to set the, set the stage for your interview, for your work, for, you know, like you're imbuing all these messages in your book. And so it's really important that you're using this strategically. Okay. So like Ryan Donald's portfolio here, like that's a pretty hot portfolio. So, like Diane, like if you were just kind of like to give me your impressions of it, like what sent, what feelings, what sentiments do you get about like what you're going to see? Like, right. It's like the cover of a book. If you, the cover of the book, um, a regular book, like a, mm -hmm. you know, a book that you're going to read, if it has something that's interesting and then the inside of the book, the, the story is the outside of the book was the most interesting part of the book. That's a terrible kind of, uh, and it happens sometimes, but really that's not the idea. And, and I think you would probably say this as well. The, I, the goal is not to have a, a beautiful outside, but you need a beautiful outside to emulate what the beautiful inside is going to be. But if you don't have a beautiful outside, um, you know, it, it just is, it's first impressions, right? Right. Yeah. So like my first impressions with this is that, that this is somebody who has a high level of attention to detail. Craft. You know yeah. that. Yeah. And craftsmanship is on point. And before I even see any of his work, I know that there's an artisan feel an artisan, you know, ability mm -hmm. uh, there and that there's good taste and we haven't even seen the work yet. And so what's happening is where he's using his format for his portfolio to set the tone set the stage for the whole rest of the interview and I think that sometimes you know and and this is this kind of gallery of portfolio books mentality is when you see this super cool and you're like oh my gosh I want that the problem is is that this might not have the right messages for your audience 
Mm. Okay. And so you can't just erase his name and put my name on there like and and have it work the same way right so everybody's portfolio needs to be a little bit different there needs to be some different angles put into it and that's what i really wanted to get at is what are those angles what are those things what are those messages that we need to put in it so the thing that i see students doing is designing portfolios for themselves mm -hmm. and i'm like you know it's your content it's your design it's your description of your work it's your you know, you're writing and all that stuff, but the portfolio itself isn't for you. And so a lot of the decisions that are made need to be broken down with taking, you know, yourself out of the equation, you know, so you, I, okay. go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> so I, I have a question um, and it goes with kind of our next question in the thing was, so should your portfolio focus on what's your strongest design skill or show a little bit of everything? And I, I think maybe it's going to change every time depending yeah. on who you're interviewing with. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So it's kind of a living, breathing document. Now your portfolio represents your best work, right? But it also has to be your most applicable work for the job that you're applying for. Right. So like, you know, if I'm a fantastic model builder, it's not going to show up in my portfolio. It is not relevant to the position that I'm applying for. Right. So what, what about if you have your digital portfolio versus your physical portfolio? I mean, because it seems like your portfolio online is going to be bigger or house more things than maybe your, your physical portfolio that you show in an interview will be. That's okay. There's no harm in having differences in your physical book and a digital book, okay. but, you, but you do need both you know, and it doesn't have to be a 50, 50, you know, like a, a mirror image of each other. They can be different. Now they should still have the same visual voice, the same tone, the same grid system, the same, you know, branding elements, but um, it's okay to have differences in it. And in fact, one of the different things out, you know, so I see students categorizing portfolios a lot and they'll have a, you know, logo design, portion and they'll have a photography and they'll have a, you know, brochures, magazines and collateral. They'll have all these different categories. And personally, I think that's a mistake because what it does is it takes you certain, you know, to click in and when does a logo, when you apply it to a package, you know, and then that goes into a point of purchase, like that fits in multiple categories and it gets really confusing about where it fits and it starts to feel redundant. If you're looking at it, if you're in the logo category and see a nice logo, then mm -hmm. you packaging and then you see the same thing and you're like, well, didn't I just see that? It becomes confusing for the viewer. So that's a, that's this idea that you haven't thought, you haven't looked through that lens of the person who's going to be looking at your portfolio enough. Now so, it's fine to tag that content. You can tag it as logo design, packaging design, you know, and filter it on your website that way, but don't divide it up into separate pages. That's I, my personal opinion. I really like that idea. So maybe more of, it kind of actually works more like a, a freelancer would work because this is like a case study and you're doing all the portions of this. And so maybe you would break it up into industry. Mm -hmm. so Possibly. Um, so I think your portfolio is representative of you as a whole person, you know, all of your skills, not just your, you know, illustration skills or, and so that's why I think all of your portfolio work needs to be in one spot and to be, you know, you can have filters on it, but don't put it, don't divide it up into different pages. The other thing that I feel like happens a lot is let's say that you only have one video project. And so I click on your video tab and I only see one project there. What it does is it creates um, the perception of that you're weak in video, right? But if your portfolio is all in one spot and you have a video project, then I don't notice the numbers. Oh, he's got 10 logos, but one video. Right. You know, even if the video is good, it still reads as a weakness. So I've, I'm a real strong believer in that your portfolio is your portfolio. And especially when it comes to the web, you can filter it, but don't divide it up into categories. I think. So how would you filter it? So what you can do is you can tag it. And you can tag your logos as logos. And, the, and if you wanted to filter your content to just see the logos, you could use that tag, meta tags, to, to filter out all of the package design and video work. Or if you just wanted to work, look at, you know, the, the, 
the but way you know, that we're familiar with filters on the web. Yeah. Right, right, right. I get that part. But if somebody is like, I guess, you know, if I'm designing a site for a client and they have services, we break it into different categories. And so in a way we are a service uh, industry to a lot of extent, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe you would, you would not break it up as what you're designing, but what actually what you could do uh, and do like a, a, I don't know, what would you call it then? So, so there are examples of my work. They're not, I'm not selling my, my only my illustration skills. You know what I mean? Like I don't talk to clients that way. I talk to clients and say, look, here's my range. Here's how deep I am. Here's the breadth. Here's the, you know, and I can do things that I'm not even showing you, you know, and I want to leave that open. And so I don't want to narrow that too quickly, you know, so by putting it into categories. So Hiba also said she shows um, her sketches. She'll bring in a sketchbook and show her process. How important do you think that is on the website or actually in person? It's very important. You have to do it in at least one spot. It needs to be present, but you don't need to do it on every single project. It can get repetitive. You can show too much. You need to edit and curate your portfolio so that you show your range and your abilities. Your ability to ideate is, you know, really important. And I think almost doing a book on that right now about sketching. And so those are important uh, things to show, but you don't want to overdo it. Okay. So. Anyway, so this idea that your portfolio isn't for you is really important, you know, and the odds of hitting your target go up when you can identify what you're aiming at. So one of the things that I'm trying to get my students to do, or I require them to do, and if you're not a student, this is something that you should go through the, the motions of doing, is to figure out who your portfolio is for, right? Because this is, this is a big deal. Your portfolio is for them. And if you're not identifying who that audience is, you are having superficial conversations when it comes to critique and using your class time and to you know, make decisions about your work. You're, you're just making a portfolio that you think is cool, but who knows if your audience will. Interestingly, what I did with my students' resumes, I had, you know, they were working on resumes, and so I had them find a job on you know, a AIGA or something like that, and uh, I had them write their resumes, and then I ran both of those things through a keyword analyzer, and I found that my students were not talking the same language as the job descriptions that they were applying for. And I pointed that out, you know, and I can say, here you're saying, you know, school and student and project, you know, like 13 times, but over here they're asking you for a whole different set of things, and this is what they're hiring for, and you're not even speaking their language. Right. So your portfolio is really similar to your resume. It's tailored for the job that you want. So Hiba has a question or a comment, and Joe actually brought this up. Um, so what if you are more of a web or a digital designer? Um, mm -hmm. How do you bring in, for an interview, you don't really have a physical portfolio, so really all you could bring in is your your sketches or something like that. What would you suggest on something? So in that case, even if you're a digital designer, I'd still have a physical book. You know, there's all these sites where you can mock up on a laptop or an iBook or, a, you know, and show that you can, you can handle responsive design or that um, your sketches like you were talking about or your site hierarchy or, you know, some collateral pieces that you made to go along with a client that you've done web work for. There's still opportunities to put together a, not only a physical, but a digital um, uh, translation of your portfolio. Digital doesn't mean just websites too. I mean, we're talking PDFs as well. And a good PDF is, is perfectly sufficient in my mind, as is a good website. You know, one that's optimized and pay attention to file size that's, you know, set up and indexed so that you can click through it and you don't have to just scroll through pages. Like you want to use good, you know, UI and UX practices for sure. Um, but yeah, that's, that's super important. The thing is, is that, you know, you need to figure out uh, whether you're a student or whether you're a professional transitioning, what fulfillment looks like you know, what that thing is, what that position that's going to be attractive to you is like. And every decision that you make is made with solving 
or adding to the conversation or resolving it to make yourself the best candidate as possible, right? Right. So what I do is I assign my students a six to eight page paper, first day of class. And I said, I need to know what it is that you want to do when you graduate and you're done. I need to know what you know about this field. I need you to talk to and interview two people who are in this job right now. And they don't like that. And I understand that that's not an easy ask, you know, but it's so important to get out of your own head and ground this in some sort of reality, you know, and to be specific. And, you know, I ask the students early on, what is it that you want to do? And you, Oh, I want to go into graphic design. Okay. That's huge. Where? Because there's a difference between New York and Charlotte. You know? <laughs> there's a difference between a junior designer or an internship and a senior designer or an art director or like, or even a web designer, you know, the decisions that you make with your portfolio are going to be massively different. So it's really important to get outside. It's actually critical to get outside your own head. And this really dovetails what Lenny Terenzi often preaches. I, and he's like, you know, don't, don't just network, you know, develop relationships. Mm -hmm. And so now we know Hey, you're calling and you're talking to people and you're, you're getting their, their story. You're getting, you know, little, little clues that you can put into your portfolio to, to target your portfolio strategically rather than just saying, Hey, I'm a student. Here's all the work that I did as a student. Right? So there's days of kind of like this generic resume, this generic portfolio, they're gone. Like, we need to really like begin to specialize a bit more and we need to put that into our curriculum so that our students are better prepared to hit the ground running and to, you know, start those jobs that they want. Cause that's what I want for my students. And Dan says he's found that he's gotten, as he's gotten more years designing that starting any project that writing specifically free writing like that has become significantly more important in the process. Oh, I, I might have to like rewind that and quote you, Dan. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, definitely reach out and contact me for that quote because it sounds like something that's, you know, exactly as my brother would say, you know, I smell what you're stepping in there. I think you're right on the right on the money with that. Um, so, yeah, the thing is, is that, you know, when I even though I require students to do this and I grade this and everything, you know, that's an action item and it involves you getting outside of comfort zones a lot of times and students, and I'm guilty of this myself, of taking kind of like, you know, the path of least resistance at times. I'm like, a phone call is not the same thing as an email. <laughs> Those are two. I'm so afraid though. They're, yeah. they're, so I actually think Skype is better or some sort of video chat. Sure. Is some people are, really freaked out about it. And really it's a difference um, of feeling like a professional and still feeling like a student, I think. Yeah. So it's hard because there's a psychological change that has to occur when you don't see yourself as a student anymore and you have to begin to see yourself as a young professional, right? And until you mentally make that switch, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of times it's that moment where you get the degree handed to you, but Diane, you had this metaphor, so it's like a relationship, you know, getting married. And you don't just like all of a sudden decide one day, hey, I'm getting married, and you get married that day. You have this relationship, right? So it's getting involved with AIGA and AAF and, you know, all of these opportunities that come along with design recharge and things like that and getting to know people and building those relationships so that you're more aware of how your work is going to be looked at and, you know, leverage those relationships. Like there's no shame in that game, you know, to say, Hey, can you help me out? You know, I'm looking for a job in this area. But it's, it's harder to say, Hey, can you help me out if I've never met you at all? <laughs> yes. You know, it's like, Hey, let me have, let me understand who you are. And I definitely think, Hey, can I help you out with anything? And then when I want a favor to call in, then it's not that big of a deal because I've been helping these people out all along the way or giving and if you're not in the same city you could help people out by giving real critiques in a in on social media mm -hmm. or in a slack group or whatever like being really present I think is a way for you to have a relationship 
Yeah, absolutely. And, and opportunities like portfolio reviews and portfolio critiques and things like that, like jump on those. Even if your work is not ready for a critique yet, like go, you'll learn so much. And some of the, um, AIGA did something last um, August where it was like it, it, for newer um, emerging designers. So these maybe weren't necessarily students, but they had just recently graduated. They were between zero and five years out in the real world. And I'm sure that there are things going on all around that are doing things like this through AIGA or Creative Mornings or something like that. Um, and I would tap into that, especially if you're within that range. If not, if you aren't in that range, ask to be a, you know, a critiquer, um, ask to sit on a panel because it at least gets you in, you never know. It doesn't, just because somebody um, that is new in the field, they may have a job opportunity for you later. You know, it's not like just because you're, you've been in the field for 12 years or 20 years or 30 years that you can't switch jobs and go and you maybe somebody that you met somebody in a different you know capacity now is going to be on the other side of the table for you absolutely like leverage your social media there are so many nice people aaron droplin you know is super nice and he will you know be your facebook friend and you know what i mean and you can follow and you can see you don't have to be like ne necessarily like bugging you know somebody but you can you you have these insights and they're right there you just need to get in the game and get engaged in it right and so yeah. I'm like, you can't be passive with this. If you want to have a killer portfolio, one, you need to know who you're designing it for, and two, you need to start building relationships. And you can't do it without those two ingredients. And Joe said designers are some of the most open and inviting people I know. And I absolutely agree as well. Um, it's a small world too. You and know, I, so, yeah, you know, Andre, and there are different fractions or different parts of Andre said I did it in comics conventions not exactly in the design event company but he's actually in Portugal and he's an amazing illustrator and so you just kind of find a segment that you want to attack and then you attack it you can't just be there one day and think oh I'm going to ask them for blah blah now you know yeah. when I moved to Chapel Hill you were like oh my gosh you're near one of my favorite designers Lenny so I would I said hey Lenny let's grab a beer I'd like to meet you you know I you know, Diane, I, I'm shamelessly name dropped you. And you know, I, he's a great guy. I'm so glad that you introduced us. So yeah, that's what you got. Well, you're great too. I, I figured <laughs> well, thank you could be good friends. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, um, and two, you know, I'm still sending people to Richmond, you know, and I'm thinking about the people that I went to graduate school with who are still there. And then people went to you know, Maryland and Virginia Beach and, all, you know, and I have connections now with those areas and students should come talk to me because a lot of times I sit in my office thinking, oh my gosh, how can I help these students when all they need to do is stop in and just be, have a conversation, you know, like I'm holding office hours, but anyway, you that's should. a whole nother side. <laughs> that's a whole nother <laughs> conversation. Yeah, for sure. So Anyway, um, kind of moving forward so we don't like, you know, beat this dead horse to death and all the things that students should do, right? Because I know that you guys um, have a lot on your plates and it's not like there's all these opportunities for all of us to do all the time and you have to kind of be strategic with it. But what this is about, if I ask you to describe what you're seeing on the screen. Ask them and put it, tell them to put it in the chat and I'll yeah. read some of the answers. Yeah. What's the tell first me, thing you see? Seeing. Yeah, yeah. What is this? How do you interpret this? We just got to give them a minute. They're and all Dan asleep. Said, they out on the no, no, no. There it is. Uh, Dan said the buying somebody a, a coffee goes a long way too. So Victoria says a cross. Um, Hiba says a forward arrow. Fabio says a cross. Lots of crosses. Lowercase t, Joe says. Yep. Sometimes I get kite. I get a knife. I get a plus. Ooh, Andre says a skeleton. Nice. Very, very. So <laughs> it's really interesting, right? And this is kind of like, you know, if you've ever heard um, somebody describing, you know, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, right? So mm. this is six dots, you know, and, I, you know, nobody just shouted out, hey, it's six dots, right? <laughs> Design yeah. did something to this, right? So there's an alignment there. And because there's an alignment and because it's been, 
you know, the dots have been aligned in a particular way. We're looking for meaning out of it. Mm. And this is exactly like your portfolio. You can cr critique each individual piece in your portfolio, kind of the micro view, but then you collect, you critique the portfolio as a whole, the macro view. And so the work that you put into your portfolio needs to be strategically chosen, but the messages of your entire collection also need to reinforce that message. Right. And so it's also the spaces in between, you know, exactly. it's like the pauses, it's how you present your work. It's all that negative space that it's those soft skills that you have to have. Yeah, exactly. You, I mean, yeah, that's exactly it. So you can talk about the transition and the narrative between your pieces. Like it should, you should not have an identity crisis when you're showing somebody your portfolio. It should look like it came from one designer who's focused on something that they're passionate about mm -hmm. and that it's applicable for the job that they're applying for. It sounds so easy, doesn't it? But when we're sitting here working on it and we're like, oh my gosh, you know, like, and sweating it out or or on the other side looking at standing at the bottom of the mountain looking at the avalanche of work coming at us we like you know kind of go snow blind a little bit and say we just get panicky right mm -hmm. so you're being hired by somebody to do work <laughs> and you need to talk their language to say that I can do the type of job that you're looking for there's this really cool story about Gibson guitars and I'll get to it in just a second. But I guess the point that I wanted to make here is that nobody's hiring mediocrity. They're hiring because they want some energy and passion, incitement, enthusiasm, you know, something that they saw in you and in your book, you know? So Gibson Guitars came, you know, was a company that started in early 1900s and they were really innovative. And, um, you know, they, they did all these kind of, you know, they kind of bucked the system a little bit and they created some new technologies for musical instruments. I think they even worked on the arch type, uh, arch top guitar, which, you know, eventually it was became the hollow body. And I think they were the first guitar manufacturer anyway, to, to come out with that design. Well, Gibson came up with this campaign that says, only a Gibson is good enough. And wow, that was like, like mic drop in the music world. You know what I mean? And they knew that musicians wanted the hottest guitar. That is exactly what the people who you're showing your portfolio want. They want the most bang for their buck. They want to hire the most capable, most energized person whose portfolio hits their desk. Interestingly, the main rival at the time was Epiphone Guitars. And so they came out with a campaign that said, when good enough just isn't good enough. It was like, oh, snap. <laughs> it was like battle of the words. Like, you know, like what a campaign, you know, on both sides, you know. And so that's what somebody is hiring for. They don't want good enough. You have to show them greatness in your work, in your focus, in your messages, and all that stuff has to come together. So go wait. ahead. Wait, I have a question before you go. So what do you think is the balance of, because a lot of times some maybe the client work that you've been doing is not maybe where all your best ideation was or somebody didn't choose the most creative, you know, opportunity that you had supplied. Um, they went with a different uh, option. Um, so what do you think is the balance between passion projects and real work or between the work that you are currently making a living doing and the work that you that you want to be doing that's such a good question did, did, is that your question or did somebody else on the oh that's my question number four <laughs> high five for you extra credit um <laughs> so the answer is is that your work is your work and you don't have to show the version that the client chose or the version that you got an A on, or the version that was printed, or mm -hmm. the version that you won an award for. You show the version that you like, that is your, that you feel is the strongest, I guess, solution that you came up with yourself. It's your portfolio. Mm -hmm. Now you might bring in another version of it that said, and this is what the client ended up going with, you know, there was, and you don't want to badmouth your clients, but you want to, you know, cause that's a, you know, 
a trip to nowhere quick. But you also want to say like, and here's how I envisioned it. And I think as long as you contextualize it this way, this is what, you know, this is what I got passionate about. And, you know, there are some other voices and, and I love this Charles and Eames quote. He's a, you know, somebody asked Charles Eames, did you ever compromise? And he said, no, but I've accepted constraints. And uh, I was like, aha, that's the answer that I needed. Right. And you say, no, but I accept my client's constraints. And this is the, some of the constraints that they had me accept. And that's what you do as a designer. A lot of times is work within constraints. So the metaphor here with these diamonds though, you might be like, what in the world am I looking at? Um, so when you see a rough diamond, you know, the one that's just been pulled out of the ground, it doesn't look anything like this, does it? And what happens is, is that rough diamond goes to a gem cutter and he cuts all of these little facets into the diamond. And they're cut in a way that's designed to bounce light all around inside the diamond to make it look brilliant. And that's exactly what you do with the decisions in your portfolio. You make all of these little micro decisions along the way so that you look like the most brilliant candidate on the other side. Your portfolio is tuned to just that particular candidate. That's why it's so important to get outside your head, to talk to somebody, to identify your audience, to get to know their preferences and things like that. It's because this is what you want at the end. A killer portfolio is the portfolio that gets you the job, not the one that you can like, you know, walk around town bragging with. And it's gonna be different for everybody. And so it's not just a matter of form, it's a matter of form plus communication and all that good stuff packaged together. and that's what you want. Does it make sense? Yes. Yeah. So I speak in metaphors a lot. So I was well, that's a to, lot of the type on the screen now, Ben. Yeah, I tell you. Sorry about that. You know, <laughs> I even had more, you know, I was trying to edit down. So I was talking with Cinnamon Pritchard and um, she is uh, on the creative team. She works for uh, Pace Communications in Greensboro. And I was like, you know, talking to her about this idea about this diamond. I was like, what kind of things do you want to see in a portfolio? What kind of things do you think that people mm. can communicate? And a lot of times it's not like talking about it. It's like showing somebody, right? Mm -hmm. Do you have experience working in a team? Yeah. What piece in your portfolio indicates that you're a team player? And how do you credit other people on the team? Ooh, that's me. good. Right, exactly, because we don't think about that because we're in this student focused mentality and you try me, to take me, me focus. Exactly. As much credit as you can, but a lot of times it's how you share that credit that people are also looking for. And without with those student blinders on, you don't see that bigger picture. So how are you creative outside of work and what inspires you to be creative when you are in work? You know, like what other hobbies and things do you do? Um, what's your creative process like? That goes back to sketching. You know, what steps do you take before attempting to solve the problem? You know, what's the 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 length of time you're willing to experiment and potentially mm -hmm. fail before you tighten up? Um, what evidence do you have that shows how you've dealt with constraints and how do you deal with constraints that you might not agree with? Mm -hmm. So you can talk about that piece in your portfolio that speaks to you know, what you liked, but how you accepted constraints on the other. And in fact, it might make you a stronger piece in your portfolio to build that into your narrative than it is to just say, this was the piece that won an award or got an A. You know what I mean? Because right. that only goes so far in your narrative. And you say, yep, I didn't really like that decision, but you know, it's one that I felt like I needed to compromise on. Right. And that might be a popular. That's actually also, I don't know if you do this in your classes, but I know that we do this in the real world. Um, we get other people's feedback and then how you take their feedback and how you implemented it. Um, and I don't think that that's actually giving somebody else credit. I actually tell my students, Hey, you know, let's help each other, help each other. We want, you know, oh, you're, yeah. you're not competing. There's only three A's, you know, everybody could get an A. Um, but it's about how it, that is really how you do help. And I've seen so many people grow from that just being more sharing uh, what they're thinking. And even if they share something and nobody agrees with it or somebody doesn't do it, even if they at least attempted to do it and then they showed them, it's huge because then they're like, well, you know, and then I just, here's why. And they make those decisions instead of just being in their head, they're actually having to explain, which is what we have to do in the real world. Oh, totally. Yeah. So you All think right. we should ask if you're hip or cool? I think you should show it. 
Uh, I don't think you should ask. I don't think you should. I think you should be relevant, you know, like that's so what if you're a buddy buddy? Well, then, you know, then you have to find something that's interesting about you. Right. <laughs> so like, you know, it's silly, but like, you know, when I get to the final decision making, you know, like I'm narrowed it down to three or four people for, to hire for a job. I want to hire somebody who's not going to drive me crazy. If I was stuck at a mm. conference with them, I want somebody who I could like relate to, you know what I mean? And like not choke to death. And I th that's why, probably why we get along so well is we have a similar sense of humor and we're both corny. Um, but yeah, that, if that's in the work, that's in the portfolio somehow, like to me, that's a bonus. That's a win. Cause I can relate to you now, you know, right. it's not just this professional all the time, but there's like you know, a little twist in there that I didn't see coming or a little bit of revealing about, a you know, something. I think it's funny. You said that about, can I go to a conference with them? When Ben and I went to a conference and I was deathly ill and we shared the same room. We had two beds, but we shared the same room because we we're just like brother and sister. And I was really fevery that whole time. Like we were on job interviews. We had no money. You know, we were just trying to get through. <laughs> and was that I, CAA in New York? Yeah. 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 And I was like, I dropped a glove. I'm like, I'm not going back and get it. That's how sick <laughs> I was. Like, um, but it was funny because I, I can be kind of a little much sometimes. I have, um, I can be on and people energize me, but that was not how I was necessarily there. And so it's really good to be able to be, and if you know me, I need it like completely quiet to work. Like I'm so ADD that I'm, I can do it. If there's something else going in another room, I'm okay. But it, it's really nice to have somebody that you can not just have to be on. You can actually also turn it off. And that was what Ben was like for me. I could be quiet and he wasn't going to be like, are you okay? Are, are you mad at me? Like, or, or, cause at work you need somebody like that too. You need somebody who's going to be like, Hey, let's get the energy going, blah, blah, blah. And then, not be upset if you're not like that. Like, you know what I mean? Like you oh, have yeah. to be able to show what kind of, that you have energy in the right places. Um, but that, or some people who are real quiet, you know, that you're not just going to be quiet and you're never going to talk to anybody that you can actually turn it and be really engaging at times if that's not energizing to you, you know, but that you can still do it when the project um, needs it. I remember talking with Megan D and we were thinking about, um, you know, hiring her at Virginia tech. And, uh, we had a great conversation and Megan revealed that like, she is the luckiest person. She finds four leaf clovers all over the place. Like that girl is pro. I don't know how she does it. I've never found one. She has found like hundreds of them. I don't know how she, she does. Find, like 40 in a day. Yeah. Oh yeah. And so she included that in her like letter of thanks. You know, for every person that she met, there was like a little four leaf clover in there. And that became part of that, you know, sense of humor, the personality, that kind of hipness to remember, you know, everybody's name and also send a thank you letter plus a four leaf clover. You know, those mm -hmm. kind of things like those things matter. And, and don't fool yourself because it's not, you know, it's not, it's not a silo where it's work life. And then social home, you know, like, and you transition to be the person that you want to be versus your professionals. It's just you, you know, right. and all of your warts and, and all of your like, you know, where you're actually looking smooth, <laughs> you know, anyway. So, so wait, so, so, so one of the things we've been talking about, so Megan just, she stood out in her after interview by sending thank yous and the four leaf clover. So, and a lot of people send thank yous. So, um, and we kind of, we're getting to this part. So what do you, how do you feel about um, leave behinds or how do you feel about um, thank yous? Uh, do you think that we should do those things? Oh, absolutely. Not only leave behinds, but things that you can send in advance. Mm. I had a student, Brendan O'Connor, who um, wanted to go for this really, he was going for a job, at this really hip company down in South Carolina. And uh, Brendan grew a big, huge beard. And then he took pictures of himself sh shaving it off in different, you know, like lengths. He had the, oh, what was it? The choppers show one, the Hulk Hogan, the pork chops, the, he had all these different styles. And so he grew it long shaved it all off. And this was early in the semester. So he grew it all back. And he said, how do you want me to show up for my interview? 
No way. Yeah. And so they were like, well, you know, we got to see if he'll come down, you know, where, and, and they picked, you know, and they, and so he got his foot in the door just by being, you know, kind of a, that's that quirky, cool hip. Like, let's see if he can pull it off kind of thing. And it, it worked. It got his foot in the door, you know? And so it was really I'm interesting. Just, I'm just glad he didn't send like beard shavings. I was like, oh, man. <laughs> but the photo, I could do the photo. The photo would be cool. Yeah. So that's yeah. a cool so, idea. So it is how important. else do and, you and think? So that's before. Handwritten letters too. Yeah, for sure. Handwritten? Handwritten. Don't Not send just it. emails. Don't, don't type it up. Handwrite it. Yeah. Okay. So what about, um, during an interview, how do you think somebody can stand out? By knowing what it is that they want to talk about hmm. and knowing what's important, you know, and what to emphasize and, and to do your research about the company and to have questions, good questions to ask them. Like ne if never, ever, ever leave an interview. Do you have any questions for us? Nope. I'm good. Like that's horrible. You didn't do your research, right? And it shouldn't just be about you. Like, well, what is your 401k plan or something like that? It yeah. should really be about you. Um, you know, what the company culture is like or what, how, who would I be reporting to and how is the best, how, how often do you work as a team or things, things that would, I would think those would be, could be some good questions maybe. Yeah, absolutely. You want to stay away from things like what does this position pay? You haven't been offered a job, so it makes no sense to talk about mm. money. But you talk about things of, is there anything in my portfolio that you didn't see that you would like to see? Um, how soon do you think that you'll make a decision? If whether I'm chosen or not, will I hear back? Those are things that you need just for closure to give yourself some sort of, but it's not so much that you're pushing or that you're assuming that you already have the job or, you know, putting the cart before the horse, but those are good questions to ask in your interview. Ooh, ooh, sure. Joe has a thing. So he does front end development and web design. And so for his thank you, he actually created a web page that uh, they specifically developed for each person that he met instead of sending the handwritten letter and he got the job. So he th thought that, but again, that's knowing your audience. Oh yeah. That's right? awesome. Yeah. That, that's a great story too. Joe, we're going to have to talk. Um, Joe's so, awesome. Awesome. He's my friend in real life too. <laughs> and he's so like I don't you. think you've ever met anything, anybody that hasn't been. So, but, but I met Joe through Design Recharge and then, you know, he was just this little profile picture and then we were going to be at the AIGA leadership retreat. And so thank goodness his photo was clear <laughs> and I knew what he looked like. And he was like, I'm like, I know who you are. And so I gave him a hug. There you go. Yeah, that's exactly right. I, I've heard, sure you've heard the story about, you know, some of the top, um, everybody Googles themselves at some time or another, right? And so somebody bought the domain, like the paid search results for some top ad execs that they wanted to get a job with. And so when they Googled themselves, it came up with their paid position first. So it cost them like maybe a buck, you know, because nobody ever searches for that term. And they were right at, in terms of creativity and making good use of your resources. Absolutely. And the thing too with Joe, I mean, I, I would guess that he ran analytics on it to see how many people opened it when they opened it, you know, and when they went to the site and things like that, like that's just smart, good sense. Like so Joe's episode 200, you should come back and listen to his. Oh, I'm totally going to do it. Joe, I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so you can kind of read through these. I'm not going to read through all these. These are good, though. So, and Dan's was like, <laughs> Joe just said the pressure's on. Um, <laughs> and Dan's, it's, he's going to add some of these. He has an intern coming in. He's going to add some of these because they are, some of them are kind of stumpers. But really, those questions that they prepare is just as important. And I know that a lot of companies will say, well, what do you think about what we do is something that, um, or what can you offer us or how do you feel like you're different? And you and I have talked about this before and I call this factory work. A lot of people are like, Ooh, Ooh I just want to go work at blank company mm -hmm. because you like the work that blank company does, but blank company doesn't need more of those workers. They have people that are doing that. They need somebody else that's going to help them. So say you are a hamburger joint 
You need somebody who makes French fries or milkshakes. That's what you need. You don't need more hamburger makers, right? Mm-hmm. You got that. We got hamburgers. We got that down. Yep. Now I need somebody who's doing these other things that can also make me some money and maybe drive revenue in a, a different way that I wasn't thinking. Yeah. You want to fit in, but you don't want to duplicate. And that's a really important distinction. You know, it's, you want to make sure that you are portraying yourself in the right way. Like, like you're saying, you, you know, if, if I'm got a hammer in my toolbox, next time I go to Lowe's, I'm not buying another hammer. I'm buying right. a wrench or something that extends my range. And that's part of what your portfolio and knowing your audience really helps you do is make sure that you're, you're in the right area with how your work is being perceived, but not duplicating exactly what's happening there so that they can't offer anything new to their clients. Right. So, um, wait, so I have, so how, how would you think now the first one that you showed that I can't remember what his name is, but like the really nice Mm -hmm. wooden, um, piece, what, um, how about if I can't afford that and that's really out of my budget, what, Oh, is this the next one? So this is my next slide, but I'm going to answer it while people are reading this. Okay. Comment. So I had talked about that. This is a $2 cigar box. It's a wooden cigar box, right? And I saw this and I was like, you know what? I could turn this into a portfolio. You know, you can pay Clo portfolios or katiebooks.com or something like that to make you a beautiful hand bound portfolio or die cut or custom inlay. You can do it yourself too. This is the same thing. I just refinished it and took the stickers off, gave it a gloss black and just threw kind of a mock-up piece in there. I don't know if you can see this, but this is a $30 portfolio. I put some upholstered fabric inside it. I can't see that part. So yeah, like it doesn't, your portfolio doesn't have to break the bank, but it does have to, you know, connect with your audience. Diane, I know that you've got a story about one of your portfolio pieces, one of your, but I didn't bring in, I, I think it had gotten moldy, but I do have a new one, but I had, when I was in going up for the position I had right before I left um, Denver um, to come to grad school, I had gotten an old suitcase, like a vintage suitcase and it fit everything on my big boards in there. Cause we were still using boards at the time. And I still think boards are okay, especially Um, I actually think printed pieces are really important if you plan on doing print work Mm -hmm. because I need to see how you deal with type. Right. And we talked about this when we had uh, Rachel and Michael on with type ed type uh, type is incredibly important in um, UX UI design just as much as it is in print design and type sometimes often overlooked. So those would be things to, but even like that, cigar case you could actually put your ipad in it so that at least shows some craftsmanship and some um it's not just your grubby old um you know ipad case or something that you've actually done something that elevates it and what happened was i would be called back and to interviews or to do, get to the second interview or I'd be called for a job offer and they'd be like yeah you were the girl with the suitcase and i'm mm-hmm. like well at least that helped it made everybody else had the big black portfolio cases you know that you would get the art supply store and most people had that and so I don't really fit in anyway and so this is a way for me it was a way for me to stand out it was heavier but it was a it was a really good and I had lock you know it had like the old lock so it it just had that it gave some of my aesthetic where I had an extra space where I guess you put your underwear in your socks. Mm -hmm. I would put my extra pieces just in case they wanted to see my sketchbook or something else like that. Yeah. And, And that's, you know, that's the purpose of your portfolio is to show you in a way that makes you stand out. And it achieved that goal. I remember hearing people at VCU talk about the portfolio in a suitcase. And I remember seeing the Garavan project, uh, that you were, you had in your portfolio at, at one point and this stuck with me and that's what you want. You don't want to be that person at the party in the corner eating guacamole, right? You want to be the person who's like commanding attention. And I'm sure there was some sort of performance aspect to your portfolio when you're like, click, click, 
you know, and they're just like, what in the, oh my gosh, you know, that's her portfolio. We thought she was homeless, you know, like, <laughs> you know, there's, there's all these different ways and you command people's attention with your portfolio and that's really, you set the stage. And so if you're repurposing, recycling, you're, you've got any of those like concerns, um, as part of your narrative, this is a great way to express that is to repurpose something for your portfolio. If you're, you know, presenting yourself as web 2.0, then you might choose a different format. That portfolio in the suitcase wouldn't work for you if you're going for web design, you know, that would be a miss. And so everybody's portfolio is going to be different. And, you know, there's, you just have to be creative. The thing that I kind of want to impress is that a lot of times I see all the work going into the pieces themselves and not how they're displayed in the portfolio. And when I went to the, the order. Yeah, exactly. In the AIGA portfolio review, you know, I saw some work that it was good work, but like there was no hierarchy on the page at all. Like they had forgotten about hierarchy and type and grid systems altogether. And I was like, you know, you, I can see the, the effort that you put into the pieces, but you're not putting that same, thoughtful considerations into how you're displaying it in your book. And that has to go with bindings and formats and page counts. And there's a lot to it. And so that's obviously part of the conversation as well. That hey, my mom's that. here. You can say, Hey, Hey, how's it going? <laughs> <laughs> so one thing, so Kent had asked me, um, he actually came to our portfolio review and that's how I met him. Um, and I would definitely like um, Josh Ash, you're in Philadelphia, like go, this would be so nice to be able to, you know, use these people who are, we need you to come and be reviewers at portfolio reviews. Even if you're not involved in AIGA, ask the school. I mean, Josh Ash, Ash works at a school, um, but he's not a professor. Mm -hmm. He's a designer. So, but yes, so we are having our annual, um, we call it Flourish as our portfolio review. So Kent, it's like the first week in March, I believe. Um, but figure out when it is. I definitely, we are encouraging our juniors to go as juniors instead of just waiting till their senior year. Do you think that's a good time? Oh yeah, it's a great time to make an adjustment. Yeah, absolutely. To begin thinking about, what it is that you want to do and how you're going to get there as early on as possible is fantastic. It's also the confidence they need. Like um, sometimes they get freaked out a little bit yeah. and it gives them a, a chance to practice. The more you can practice talking about your portfolio and talking about the work in your portfolio with people who don't know it, the better you are at explaining and expressing yourself in a more natural, non um, anxious filled um situation when you're at a real interview. Yeah. So when you have pieces in your portfolio, typically it's between eight and 20 pieces. And that number is determined by your audience, like who, who it's for. And so what I do is I require my students at Elon to have a nine piece portfolio. Okay. And if that's the minimum and they can do more than that, but that's what in my class. And so I divide it up into a critique of three projects, three more projects and three more projects. The first round I critique the second round. I asked somebody else to critique and Diane, you did this for me in the past. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and then the, the third round I get um, uh, the faculty in the communication design program to critique it as a whole, because it's really good to get multiple critiques on your portfolio and get it in progress so that, and just know that nothing's done until, you know, like I've never completed a, a design solution that I've been hundred percent happy with. I will always go back and tweak it and work it. And that's just part of design. And so don't get so invested that in your solution that you can't make a change if you get good feedback on that piece. Um, but yeah, you need to leave. And that kind of goes with, you know, so here's your portfolio of variables. And then, so if you know who it's designing for and you know, like what you have to put in it and you know what you control, which is the number of pieces, the quality of your work, the curation of your portfolio, like you're editing it, the order that you put your work in your portfolio is really important. You want to open with a strong piece that lets people know that you are a serious contender and you want to close with a super strong piece. And maybe in the middle, you get one of your headier, more intellectual type of, you know, like design solutions. So you have, really have to control the flow of, of your pieces one to the next and how that works in with your narrative. So let me ask you a question. Yeah. What is considered one piece? 
So one piece is not something that is a hard and fast rule, just like the number of pieces in your portfolio. However, if I'm seeing a logo and then I turn the page and I'm seeing a second piece is the logo on a packaging solution, that's one piece. You're, they're visually connected together and you can have them on two different pages, no problem, but that is one piece in your book in my mind. So, you know, things like photography, in my mind, there's that photography side of you. All of your photography is one piece in my mind. So I'm seeing your range and I'm seeing that, you know, you can control a camera and I'm seeing that you can communicate through photography. So but show me something new. So I like to say this and you can tell me whether, and I know you will tell me if you don't. <laughs> no, I don't. Cause you're like my brother. <laughs> so um, the brother I don't have. So if anybody's like, oh, I didn't know she had a brother. I don't, that's my brother. Um, so what if um, some people who do illustration or photography and they put it in, I actually prefer to see it in context. Well, yes. how would this work? Like, well, could you make a, a you know, an app and use those, illustrations in a way or can you make a magazine article or an annual report using those those photographs or something to me it doesn't say as much if I just did a illustration of the moon but like uh, Fabio last week he did uh, a poster with his illustration and it was like I mean he had, does a ton of awesome posters but but he put it in context by having it as a poster or as a button or as a, a coaster or something, you know, it seems like I, I see that a lot where people aren't making that they're asking a lot of the viewer to see where to put their pieces. Yeah. Have you ever, I know that we did this in graduate school, so I know the answer to this, but have you ever put design work on a wall in a gallery? Like it just fails, doesn't it? Because it's, meant for a particular environment mm -hmm. you know that that you know coffee bag package that you designed is meant to be photographed in a coffee house you can have you know a nice picture you can have a physical piece to hand somebody and that's great but i really feel like design is is its strongest when you show it in the environment that it was created for you know right, right. You get a sense of scale. You get you, there's so much information that's there that isn't on just a blank, drunken white screen, or you know, like you can't. There's a lot of information that gets lost. So what about putting in work that you and we're like out of time, just so you know. So we gotta <laughs> we gotta do a part two, I guess. But what about putting in work like if I wanted to do more illustration work? How would I? But I don't have very much illustration work in my portfolio. That's client work. It's mostly passion projects. How would I incorporate that? And, and I know people who only put on their site the things that they want to do. They still do other things. They may do website design or do something, but they only have the illustration on there. I think it comes at a certain point in your career. I actually don't, I don't know if you can do that right out of the gate and be able to survive and not have to have a job at Starbucks or something. Mm -hmm. but what do you so think? hopefully the job that you're applying for is either the job that you're excited about or a stepping stone for the purposes of getting you that job. If you want to be an art director in New York, go for it. But the expectation that you're going to graduate and then get that job is like winning the lottery, mm -hmm. you know, but you can work towards that goal. And so the things that you put in your portfolio are for that next step or for that position. And it can't be enough just to have a passion project with, where that doesn't relate to the position that you're applying for. But if it relates, man, it will come through in spades. Like that's a home run. Like you want to put, you know, a few of those in and you, you know, don't put so many that you're looking like a one trick kind of pony here, but you know, you want to have breadth and width, but you also want to show like, that's the stuff that you love. That's the stuff that you wake up in the morning for that illustration gets you going and you feel like you're good at it. And let me show you an earlier piece and let me show you where I am now. So I can get a sense of how you're evolving and developing as an illustrator. Like that's, that's legit. So this is another question that I definitely want to have answered before I let you go. So how do you represent your decision-making skills because you talked about maybe doing a headier one in the middle. How do you represent those decision-making skills in your portfolio? Like with what kind of project or do you have any suggestions? So you can do that. You know, somebody asked earlier about uh, sketching, 
And sketching is a great way to, to talk about how an idea, a concept evolves and develops, right? And then you can show, you know, some early roughs, you know, in there too, as well as the final. Like there's, and that shows you like how you solve problems as a designer. And that's really important because we don't know what the next problem is going to be, right? right. You can, it could be anything. And that's the exciting part of being a designer is I don't know if I'm going to work on a bottle cap or a billboard, you know, it has, it's each project has its own unique constraints. And so how I work through those solutions is really important. And I've had clients do a 180. I show them the final piece and they're like, yeah, I don't like it. And then I walk them through my thought process and they're like, I like it. I get it. I understand what you're after. And I'm like, that's it. You know, like I get that's to me is means I'm communicating and that those sketches were really important, you know, to bring people along the way. So Fabio said, I'm screwed then because he works so <laughs> quickly. But Fabio, if you go back in your Instagram, I see sketches and I see some of those. It just, it doesn't mean that everything you do, you have to sketch, but think about a bigger project, especially some of like hand lettering. You're kind of figuring out how you're working on something and then you're putting it in the computer. I saw a sketch of something you did. Uh, you just need to, I think incorporating some of those, but for him, I think it's the ideation. He has to come up with a hundred t-shirts that are going to be sold on the carnival cruise line, going to Alaska to show the range of all of those actually mm -hmm. is part of that process. I would think for him. Right. Yeah. And, and the range and style too. I mean, we, I would hope that it's not just one. No, style. It's all different yeah. styles. Yeah. Like, yeah. And so you're doing what people need to see. And you might have a section in your portfolio where you devote three or four pages to just different types of things, illustrations that you're passionate about, that you like, or that were used, that you feel were particularly successful. And that's great. I mean, that's legit. So Laura has a, a, a comment. My issue, she says, my sketches are on scrap paper, post-it notes, memo pads, napkins, and paper towels. So I would say, Laura, scan those suckers in. Get one of those, like, I have a DoxyGo. I think I got it from, like, Mighty Deals for, like, $100. But it's portable so that you can actually put in, maybe not the post-it. You'd have to put another piece of paper underneath it so it wouldn't get sticky under there. Send it through, scan those things in, and then have that as part of, you know, build your own, like, PDF that is these sketches that comes together is what I would say. What would you say? The other thing is get a, get a sketchbook and carry it with you, you know, a nice moleskin, uh, Aaron drop on throw out to, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the, um, what is it? The, gosh, I just flew out of my head. My student, Joshua, he's our age. <laughs> but, um, he, I, you know, they had, they have to do the art sale project. I think they're in backwards now. Oh, well, anyway, he did these sketchbooks and they're, Moleskins are inside, but you could have put draplins in there. Um, but field so notes. that's what I was thinking. Field notes, yeah. Hit me. Yep. Whoops. Anyway, so some are lined and then some are um, blank, but you could do whatever. But these are super, super nice. So my mom's giving me this one. Mom. <laughs> Uh, you could send your mom my address for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> but he, no. he hand did all the leather and bound it. And so that it's, Oh my gosh. That's I mean, awesome. and they smell really nice. And then he also used our laser engraver. Nice. Anyway. So, so, something like that is like, if you carried something like that and it was filled up with all of your sketches, like you don't need to have sketches for just a particular project. You can say, here's some of my sketches that I've done and you're free, free to look through this. It's for all different types of projects that I've been working on. The thing is, is you don't want to have 10 or 15 pages filled up on a, you know, hundred page notebook that leaves the, a bad impression that you right. but it build something up, you know, and you're just like, it was doodles and notes and thoughts. And, you know, you were thinking about biology and you pulled in this chemistry thing. And, you know, like to me, that's amazing. That's totally what I would say. I would be so impressed. I just think you need to, I, I like having something that's valued you know, but I mean, I, I use those, I use these, these are my favorites. Look, it's all Fabio and then Brian <laughs> Young. Um, but like, these are flexi sketches and uh -huh. I mean, granted I'm working, part of it's empty, but there's, you know, drawings and then I'll put other things on the other side, but it's just, 
I mean, I don't know if I'd show this in the interview, but if it was about a specific, just put a little flag and then have it so that you could, you know, yeah, show them a specific project. And taking notes is really important and showing them that you actually aren't just drawing, that you're actually listening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. I would agree. It's funny now because you see so many people who are doing the adult coloring books. You know what I mean? And yeah. we're the people who are make we're, we are living that profession right now. So there's a particular appreciation for it that, I mean, it's, it's great to have something like that and you should totally carry around the sketchbook and just, you know, be a visual yeah. person. And that helps you get that message out. Listen, that's, that's good. Listen to what Kent says. I like this. He says, it's interesting that you mentioned a novel earlier. I tell the students that their portfolio is their story and they have to use it to tell potential employers who they are as a designer and as a person and they are worth the gamble employers are, if the employers are willing to take it. Absolutely. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah. Really, you're sharing that potential, your potential with someone else. Yeah. Well, do you have any closing? We'll just have to do a part two, Ben. So I've had some students contact me, especially some of your students, Diane. I've been swamped at the end of the semester here. But if anybody wants to submit either their portfolio or pieces to their portfolio for consideration for the book, I would love to have examples. It's so helpful to have a student, you know, who puts a portfolio piece out there and then we can talk about it and we can break it down into what it's communicating and so that other students can see like, oh, wait, I have got a wine label in my portfolio, too. Let me check and make sure it's communicating the message that I want. Or, you know, so examples are really helpful. Hey, can you stop the screen share? Yes. <laughs> I can, I think. You just go up to the top. Oh, boogers. There you go. Because um, I needed to go <laughs> and get your email. So um, for people who are listening on iTunes, you can reach Ben. And even if... I don't know if you'd be willing to do non-student portfolios. Oh yeah, totally. Okay. So anybody's willing to put in stuff. If you have like a really good portfolio case or outside piece, or you want to show a series of pieces, um, reach out to Ben at Ben B E N Hannum H A N N A M at gmail.com. So that's Ben Hannum at gmail.com. And it will be in the show notes too. But he said that was the best way to reach him. So, oh, I have hit everyone. Bookers, I hate <laughs> there it That's, is. No, it's only that was only for us. Because oh. for some reason, the thing now everybody sees it. <laughs> but it. So, if you're on iTunes, thank you for listening, and YouTube, thanks for <laughs> watching. That's right, <laughs> Fabio Bookers. Did I say it? I usually do. Um, but anyway, I just I'm excited. I know we didn't get through all of we didn't get through all my questions. Um, we didn't get through talking about repetition of pieces. Um, you know, we did kind of talk about what constitutes one piece, but I actually, am, if you have something and you have the logo on a logo board with some other logos, and then I see a whole annual report with the logo on it there, I actually don't need to see it twice. I actually think that's padding and I don't want anything padding. Oh, so Kent says, when is the book coming out? Well, if things go well, it will be done in the next 10 months. And so it will be out a year from today. So that would be good. Would, yeah. So I've, I've finished the first quarter of it and I've got the remaining three quarters to go. So um, anybody that's teaching, I think Ben would be happy to talk to you more or um, you probably would do like a, a talk in somebody's class even, mm -hmm. um, right? I mean, not yep. virtually probably is easier, um, but you can do anything. You'd be happy. You've come to my school and talked mm -hmm. and that was really good. And I would love to have you come do that again. Sure. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Of course. Anytime. Uh, I'm right. happy to be squirrely a little bit in December and nobody better to do that with than with you. So thank you um, very much. Merry Christmas, everybody. Have a good holiday. Oh, oh, <laughs> so, oh, he said he wants, do you want to come to Mississippi? He says, and absolutely. <laughs> so um, if you want to reach out to me anytime and I am going to get back to you in your emails, I got a good bit of emails yesterday and I've had, I have a deadline today and yesterday. So I'm going to get it, get to them. I probably will get to them tomorrow. So don't think I'm forgetting about you. Um, but the, 
email to contact me is diane at rechargingyou.com is probably the easiest, the best, or diane at designrecharge.org. Um, and then hold out for, I think, January 3rd. Is that the first Wednesday of January? Let's see. Nope, January 4th. January 4th will be a rapid recharge. So it's just going to be me. It's going to be like starting off the new year and some of the things that um, I'm planning on doing. And then we'll, ha ha I think we just have a few episodes till we get to 200 because I can't remember what today is. Sorry, Ben. Um, and then we'll, we'll, it's craziness goes and I encourage you to come to Creative South as I do everyone and they don't pay me. So I just love this conference. So hopefully, maybe I'll see you. Sounds good. He's like not answering. Frozen. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> anyway, thank you guys for hanging out there. Um, and please, please contact um, Ben if you have some great portfolio pieces. And um, I think Dan, Kent, uh, Joe, definitely reach out to Ben and um, – Tell them part of your story. And thank you guys. And I'll see you next year. Can you believe it? <laughs> Merry Christmas. All right. We'll see you. Bye, guys.